this is a really unique town in, even though it's small in size, it's very unique in Nova Scotia. For such a small town to have the university seemed to really um, add a whole dimension that I don't think you get in other small towns that I've been in since. It, it just um, provides so many opportunities. Our advantage is you have university working there, you have the hospital, you have, just, you have four banks. You know, uh, people working in these banks. Uh, in, in terms of other municipalities, you, you've got uh, economic generators there that are going to remain here. St. Louis is going to remain here. The hospital is going to remain here. It's still going to be a religious center. I did come to know it as a really Catholic community. I'm not Catholic, so that really struck me because I've known a lot of Catholics, but I've never been embedded in a Catholic culture. And that's a very different experience. I think what kept the community very, very, uh, and, and, and all of Bonket was uh, the church. You'd go to church uh, when I was young, and the men would be talking outside about uh, their cattle, about the wood, about uh, whatever they were doing. And I, it was their way of meeting. Otherwise, they'd be on each their farm and have no meeting place. What impressed me when I first came, when we had the community forums, is I thought, wow, here's a community that is willing to sit down and actually dialogue about some really crucial issues. When I came here the first day, uh, the uh, lady at the uh, uh, hotel that I was staying in, uh, she says, oh yeah, this is a small community, and uh, she says, as I've told my kids, if you've done something bad in the day, you better tell me as soon as you get home because I'm going to hear about it before too long. And it's true. There's, there's the positive side and then there's the underbelly mm -hmm. to it, you know, because again in a small town if you're known, everything you do is visible. Um, and so there, you know, there are issues with that and that's what I think a lot of my own family members, especially my aunts and uncles and so forth, that's what they were trying to escape, <laughs> you know. So there's a strong sense mm -hmm. of home and tradition and coming mm -hmm. home, um, but on the other hand, you've got um, people feeling crowded and um, too visible and needing to go elsewhere for work, for education. It keeps everybody on the straight and narrow, so it's a very safe, secure, uh, very much family-oriented, very much community-oriented. I read the papers and I'll see where someone is in need of uh, assistance in getting to Halifax or getting uh, medication. And somebody's out there doing a benefit dance or a, some type of fundraising. There's just so much to build on here um, in terms of a sustainable community and so forth. But I was also aware of many of, of the issues um, around some of the raw resource industries. A lot of people from Antigonish worked for New Page and it closed down. Um, the fishing, the farming, the forestry, all of the sort of traditional businesses, even farming, is um, on a downswing. It's harder and harder to make it as a, as a farmer unless you're a large farmer. The thing is, farming is almost over. People work in Antigonish and travel here. And I think uh, there's maybe two or three farmers left, uh, two or three uh, fishermen that fish lobster fish. And then there's not any other industry in Antigonish except for the university and the hospital. I wouldn't say it in English. People go out of the community. When I was young, it was Boston. Mm -hmm. Everyone went to Boston. After it was Sudbury, nickel mines in Sudbury, and where is it now? Calgary. It really brings home, I think, um, that there's something fundamentally wrong with our economic structures. If that, if people have to leave. The beauty of Andy Ganesh is it has the university, it has the regional hospital, so there's potential for incredible economic growth here. The Cody Institute is a good example of, of where I think we could uh, uh, develop economic development. Rural Nova Scotia, it was, it was in the 30s, it was the economic depression. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was really bad around here. So, um, 
he and, and Father Tompkins, his cousin, they had been studying in Rome, so they were into co-ops and credit unions. They, they had kind of gotten a new idea, and they came back and they really started implementing it. And, and I think what worked, why it worked is because it starts with like a real respect for the person, no matter who you are or where you are, um, and, and the belief that that people have within them what it is they need to live and to live life fully. The extension department and the Cody, it, it was like building relationships of justice um, that were economically grounded. Um, so I'd say those are kind of foundations that are there, whether people are aware of them or not. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just part of the the culture. Mm -hmm. We we think because we know the word and we we have the history that it's still happening today, and and maybe it makes it harder to really look at. Maybe it's not happening as much. So although it's it's a good solid foundation, it might be a blinder for us at this point. So you you've got an institution in the middle of the town that is meant to. Um, explore new possibilities. Yeah. Um, but the traditional, um, what would you call it, the traditional um, power brokers mm -hmm. <laughs> stay the same. looking at uh, the cost of housing to purchase or to rent. It was, my lord, I believe I'm downtown Halifax for the prices that they're charging here. But it comes down to the whole thing of uh, supply and demand. The number of properties that are available over time will fluctuate as the market changes, but the growth of the area, it can't grow anymore in town. I would have expected more uh, say medium and higher density developments like say townhouses or uh, small uh, sized apartment buildings, I, I thought I would have seen more of those. It used to be that a hundred thousand dollar home in Antigonish was the high end. Yeah. Well it's not anymore, it's probably 375. That's a high yeah. price for first time buyers or young people or a single parent or you know there's a lot of circumstances that that factor into what you can afford. The people have to have a place to live in order to access a community and the uh, and a lot of people said that they liked living around here and there were a lot of good things about it but they couldn't find adequate homes. Um, I think now probably the challenge is if you need homes for low-income families there is no government funding mm -hmm. available or if there is, it's very limited. So it's like your hands are tied going in because you can't come up with what you need to come up with mm -hmm. to get these people into homes. Basically, you know, it, it says everyone has a right to a decent standard of living, to, you know, food, shelter, uh, and uh, health care. Uh, and uh, it says, uh, you know, uh, the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, 
widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances <coughs> beyond his control. And that makes a special point of motherhood and childhood being entitled to special care and assistance. So uh, after I said yes and I would come and talk about this, uh, I wondered, well, what is there to say? Everybody agrees. <laughs> Who's opposed to this? <laughs> and you know, everybody wa wants everybody to have food and shelter and clothing and yeah, medical care. Of course, you know, it's it's not controversial. Now, why is it not controversial? It's not enforced. <laughs> what's what's there to? There's no argument about it. It's it's there. It's just words on a paper. It's a, a document. And uh, since nobody is moving to enforce it, uh, there's nothing to argue about. In 2010, there were um, a series of events that were planned around poverty awareness. Um, I, there was a, a session, I think it was for October 17th, the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty. And a strong theme at that event was talking about local poverty, specifically heat poverty, people who couldn't pay their heating bills. The anti Ganesh Emergency Fuel Fund arose out of that meeting and also a wider discussion about a uh, coordinated approach to local poverty. So the anti Ganesh Emergency Fuel Fund is, uh, is a fund for individuals who are in the position that they are unable to heat their homes in the winter months. The goal of the anti Ganesh Emergency Fuel Fund is that eventually it will become like a food bank except for fuel. Trying to find a home in Anakinish um, is difficult. You have the rent, you have damage deposit, electrical deposit. Some places don't have electric heat, and if they do, you're looking at electrical prices, and if not, then oil and electricity. The hookup fees can be prohibit prohibitive. They can be anywhere from 400 to $600 just, just to turn the power on in your house. And Nova Scotia Power is willing to negotiate, whereas our, minute, our town, uh, in the town of Anaganish uh, is very firm. They will not negotiate and it puts people on a low income in quite a bit of distress when they're, as you can imagine, you're, you're moving, um, it can, you're already stressed out and now you need to find hundreds of dollars that you just don't have. So uh, there needs to be more uh, compassion and understanding for poverty and um, a willingness to be supportive to the extent that they possibly can. Now, was it just last week or the week before that Mitt Romney declared that he's not very concerned about these issues? He's not concerned about the poor, uh, which was not completely surprising to me somehow. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, that, I was not um, shocked by his lack of concern. That surprise came in the next sentence, where Romney stated, that the reason he's not concerned is that the poor are already taken care of. <laughs> They've got the government safety net. They're all right. Uh, um, everybody else might have, be, have, have problems, but the really poor, hey, you know, they've landed in a sweet spot there. <laughs> I, I think of this, I, don't, I, I need a name, better name for this, but I, I think of this as the myth of the sort of poverty payoff that if you get poor enough, really, really poor, you're gonna be taken care of. Everything's gonna be all right. Because people don't see it as an issue, when you go into Anakinish, it looks so beautiful. You know, it's a lovely town, lovely, lovely Main Street, um, beautiful houses. Um, and even, you know, some of the trailer courts are very well managed and well run and uh, so it's really hard to see. We knew there was a lot of vacant homes in Anakinish town, eh? And we thought this would be an opportunity to try and get some of those homes under the Nova Scotia Housing Authority. We wrote what we thought was a, a pretty good letter to, uh, to the provincial minister at the time and and uh, asking you know to, to, to do something to streamline uh, this housing, affordable housing, in a way that 
And at that time, there were 78 people on the waiting list that were approved for affordable housing and were on a waiting list. And the response we got back was, there's no problem in your area with affordable housing as far as we're concerned. You're not seeing um, people panhandling on the street or asking for money. Um, people think that housing isn't such a big deal. People are finding places to live somewhere. I see in Antigonish, or in other towns as well, the complacency. I am comfortable, and that's all that's, that's required. Our role, and, and the role of elected politicians, is to make sure that the awareness is created. When we try to form social action committees in all the parishes, there was only one or two that stepped up to the plate in, in, in all of the dioceses. And, and to me, that tells me that you know, people aren't seeing it. If we demonstrate that the problem is there, then you get the empathy. We, we had a very small uh, campaign here not too long ago where we were quite successful, and, and uh, I made some of the calls, and there was very little pushback. There was a lot of empathy for what we're trying to do. So I, I think it's a matter of uh, more effective communication and, and, and getting some of the leaders to recognize that, that, that there is a need. If you ever want to see the innocent face of poverty working in an elementary system, it's there. We talk about social justice as um, a certain entity that's commonly understood. Now, I understand it to mean that people have a decent place to live, that people have food that they can eat, that people can um, love their children and send them to school, that like every kid walks into the, my school the first day feeling like they own the world which is what every six-year-old and seven-year-old should think. But I know there's not an awful lot, to, there's a lot who don't have that. I know there's a lot of kids that come, you know, without breakfast, without good. Some kids come from home with absent parents. Some kids come from home where there's violence. It's a scary thought, but it's a reality. I drove the bus for like 27 years in this community, and in this community, um, you know, you see kids getting on, on the bus in the morning. They're not even dressed properly. They probably just put on the same clothes they had on yesterday and went out the door and got on the bus. And uh, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it, it's not changed after 27 years of doing it. You still see the same same thing. I think it's some money. Maybe it's some money that drives people to, to where they are, but when it comes to money, it certainly don't drive it around here. We have several organizations that deal with uh, emergency solutions to poverty. I mean, not nearly enough to address everybody's needs, but there's kind of a more poverty alleviation kind of role. And there was discussion about how there needs to be a deeper engagement with the causes of poverty and a deeper engagement with possible solutions to provide uh, in livable incomes for people in the community. Many of our clients are people who are, who are mired in the margins. The margins may be getting wider. People start running out of resources a little bit earlier in the year than they used to, a little bit earlier in the month than they used to. And the most that we can offer is a bit of support. Often the case is the um, unemployment insurance or the community service check or whatever part-time income they have is not quite enough to get them to the end of the month. And so what we try to do is bridge the gap between where the money runs out and when the next check comes in. We have found that over the years the community is extremely supportive of the food bank. And uh, Antigonish has always appears that always does, comes to the fore when there's, when there's requests for assistance. Normally there would be four people working Tuesday and Thursday. But in the back room here where the stock is, uh, it, there's anywhere from probably 10 to 15 people that work here off and off. The only other thing on a personal note is it is very unfortunate in this wonderful country of Canada that we have to have food banks. There's a lot of talk also about the social programs that we have and why aren't, you know, why isn't it enough. 
and one of the numbers that that often comes around is is social assistance numbers my understanding is that those numbers are actually the amount of money that you get if you're living on assistance actually keeps you 70 percent below the poverty line so it's insufficient it's just insufficient and it's really intense for the people who are trying to manage and so and that's one of the issues that actually comes up repeatedly with the fuel fund is that we are pushing people to this point of emergency and welfare rates in most provinces as we stand here tonight are well beneath the low income cutoff for all canadians in other words not enough upon which to live however modestly this is how we deal with poverty in almost all parts of canada I think it is um, kind of a doggy dog uh, mentality. We have that again. I get it my way, and I did it the hard way, and uh, let Pat's gonna get it the way she can. Most people are really working quite well at managing their poverty. Um, and so they're trying to plan so that they don't have an emergency. So that is a challenge as well. Um, if you're living below the poverty line or below the low income cutoff, it's always an emergency. Most of the jobs are entry level jobs and most of them are in retail. And um, the other, the, and they're poorly paid. On minimum wage, the ones that Tim Hortons can't afford a room, can't afford a room, a boarding room. So, you know, things, it's some of the top pay's gotta come down and the minimum pay's gotta come up. So if you've got an entry level, level job and your the cost of housing here is um, very high because it's a university town, then it's really hard for people. They have to either bring in roommates or they have to, um, they can't really just rent something and be self-sufficient. Basically, I found the roommates because it was the only way I could afford accommodation. Um, I really would prefer to live in a one-bedroom place by myself, and that's what I've been doing for the past uh, year and a half or so. Um, but I may need to go back into a roommate situation, which is not something I'm looking forward to. A friend of mine told me about a place that was being rented by the room, so I moved in there. Uh, the landlord was absolutely horrible, however, and ended up getting a lease for the entire house rather than just for individual rooms. And so he decided at that point that he was going to kick me out and he tried to do it with about two weeks notice. I moved to Anaganish originally to attend the university here. I wasn't able to get enough money in student loans to cover all of those expenses. Uh, so I ended up getting a job at the call center. Uh, it can be very difficult to find housing in Anaganish for starters. Uh, I mean, I have two cats. Uh, and they're very important to me, and I'm certainly not interested in housing that won't allow me to bring them with me. Cost is another issue. Uh, even when I was working at the call center, I was never really making a whole lot of money. Uh, the pay was never great, and now that I'm unemployed, obviously, I am earning even less. I'm living at an apartment where my landlady could very, very easily be getting at least $100 a month more for that apartment than what I'm paying. But she's really, really nice and doesn't raise the rent on me. <laughs> I contacted um, the two candidates running for mayor um, and asked them, you know, about the about affordable housing and the reason why I was thinking about that was just because um, I recently lost my job and I wasn't able to find other employment and I was in a situation where I was thinking I'm gonna have I'm gonna lose my apartment 
turned 19, she wanted to uh, move out, get a place of her own, which uh, me and her father both thought she should stay home for a while. Mm -hmm. But she was pretty insistent on moving out, so we gave her her own way, let her go. Uh, the first place she found uh, was on Church Street, which was, to me, when I saw it, I could have died. I said, no, this is not, it's not fit for a human being to live in. I mean, the, the toilet was in under the stairs, and you could see through the cracks of the stairs. It was so bad. The sink, the, the shower stall was right beside the kitchen sink, and there was no bathroom sink to wash your hands in. I guess you washed that in the kitchen sink. There was another doorway right beside her counter, and she said at night she could hear people like rattling it. And I used to think like that to me would be enough for me to move out. I think with me and her father pressuring her to move, that she finally decided to get another place. And she did, she found a place on Hawthorne Street, which I think was the same price, 350, but it was, um, yeah, it was for, it was not for students. It was a rent control, low income, no students. That's what she told me. So it was a little better. But then she decided to go back to school, and of course she wasn't allowed to live there. And then she moved to Williams Point. It was the basement of a house, and there was one window, and a kitchen, and a bedroom. I can't even remember if there was a bathroom. Maybe she shared the bathroom with someone, I don't remember. But uh, yeah, it was, it was terrible. It was filthy. And I'm thinking, like the poor students, they just don't have a prayer because what they get for what they can afford is something I wouldn't want my dog to live in. Maui Modi Wawan Gigong. Good evening. Miss Gigala Gigamanaka Imodi Jigan in uh Wanjigong. And then Muksi Giga Amushpa El Duagala Wanjigong Maldana up church for Gulaman. Bochi go in the age, Dan A. Moody. We got him a squeaky no more when she gone was called immediately. Got Bob Bochi Maui dying, near signing, near Wiggy Ladder down, no jeez, I hope David is Mala, Honijin Wa. I had a bit of us a gum, us a gum, they see a little. Got a but double age, down the daily suit here. So the way Nina, it away a bar, you got to win on my at kick and digging and tumble out, dalek and digging and got to a Delaware, Minoy, Yitchka, at kick, telling me to go, so we were in Mofti, so we're missing them one again. I went to go make that little Minoy gave me. Ah, Maha, the Lord of Nina. Anka Moksin da winning. Biskamana Dilimuluk ah the ladik is in na not low this in a koi. Anka muski first down the di uh down the twitchy in ha down down the Louis to na dan dan uh dan de lean. Mwa bwal no gam sinman when ji go my ginamalog. Guess the Lord is exquisite, no, like Megan. Would I, Ja? What a meeting when I see a Samadi in a kilo, a ninin. So I Samadi in down to Jukis and I think I see a cigar da octon. Now, my when I what a mobile bar, Nenoxin. So, we'll ask you, Koi. We'll ask you, and same guest of since we look see a blooded. Monina, you a summit sheet of Dandy Twitchy, a Sulia, which is Dandy Sigma, when she gone, a way to Dandy. Gadua Boshia, Boshi Gregaja, who done meaning? Boshim Sigi, Nigay. Um, said me, would and bought him cigar. So, got a gobble no little with a he can move this in a I when you go. Aha, uh -huh. got um, I was better than a bus nook, take it in a double. I nook the one hot as he got uncle. So, ah, no, 
Mahadalian, a much further way up. May I no daddy did when she gone on the big oak when I cha. Big oak when no dad when she gone, got more gobble no la, chicks to look see where in ta, the lower gobble no la, days ago, but she can no more la, days ago, missing more that's it. My experience living in a co-op basically was that uh, we had no money to do any of necessary upkeep. Part of that was because we weren't able to access any more government funding. We started to feel like it wasn't even ethical to accept more people in um, because we didn't know how or when we would have the means to fix anything. So we started to worry about uh, children getting hurt um, on steps and and uh, health health problems from mold. I was fortu very fortunate to be able to go to the uh, cooperative, uh, an annual housing cooperative meeting uh, in London, Ontario. What I had suspected was confirmed, which is that I would say, by and large, most co-ops across Canada, uh, housing cooperatives across Canada, um, it's. Uh, low-income uh, single mothers or women living on their own that are doing the bulk of the maintenance and the, the volunteer running of housing cooperatives and a lot of them are exhausted it was it was a challenging situation and honestly um, I would say only the most desperate people uh, hung on because they knew their options for finding affordable housing for themselves and their children uh, was almost nil in Antigonish. I think everybody would certainly like to live in a, you know, high quality home. Um, and I suppose perhaps people have this mentality that if you're low income and you can't afford, you know, a, you know, a high rent, that you don't necessarily deserve quality housing, which is absolutely not true. Everybody deserves to live in a place that is, you know, warm and safe. Without affordable housing, many women are choosing to stay in very unhealthy or abusive relationships. And I think that's another element that the provincial government needs to consider and the federal government. So when there's a commitment to working um, for against violence against women, having affordable housing is an important element of that fight. It's hard to find anything here, especially if you don't find something before, I said, mid-August. Forget it, because all the students have the, have already got the, any place they're gonna get, and it's like, you know, you're not gonna get anything. So we need to think about people, giving people not just adequate housing, but be above standard housing for people who not only that can, can't afford something like $800, $700 a month's rent. And if you're going to charge $800 to $700 a month's rent, it should include heat and, and, or electricity within that. There has to be some government activity happen that will allow every small town in Nova Scotia to be able to have pe people stay there so they can afford to be in housing. Mr. Speaker, we know that big corporate tax cuts aren't going to fix the housing crisis, that's for sure. And they're not going to repair the crumbling infrastructure of our cities, that's for sure. And they're not going to close the prosperity gap that's affecting hardworking families or help anybody else. And the fact is, with unprecedented surpluses, this Prime Minister should be investing in the needs of working families, not giving big corporations more tax cuts. They have enough already. Will the Prime Minister understand this basic proposition and start working for working families, yes or no? You've got to have the food banks. You have to have all that. If not, you're going to have people perish. Simple as that. But you have to do something at the same time to, to, to try to stop the cycle and reduce. We're never going to eliminate poverty. But we've we got to get <coughs> these things done to help reduce and break the cycle. Let me give you just one 
terrifying, at least I consider it a terrifying figure. Starting in October 2008, when the big crisis began, in about a few weeks, we reached about $17 trillion to bail out and to save the speculators who had created the crisis. If you divide $17 trillion by the amount that FAO had indicated was necessary to overcome hunger in the world, which according to FAO was $30,000 million a year, if you divide the $17 trillion by $30,000 million, what you get, please, is 600 years of a world without hunger. I was honestly convinced that unfortunately there were not enough resources to really solve hunger in the world. And all of a sudden, I discovered that there was money for 600 years without hunger. Well, if that is not a scandal, I don't know what a scandal could be. There is not enough money in the entire treasury of any country to solve all of family violence, all of illiteracy, physical or mental disadvantage, skill shortages, substance abuse or crime. But we do have enough to solve poverty. We do have that financial capacity. Why are we not doing that? I think it's because of some of the extreme positions on the far right and the far left of Canada's political spectrum. On the far right, topping up poor people's incomes who are of working age violates some primordial angst about paying people to do nothing. How many times have you heard that? Never mind that the vast majority of poor people in this country are working. Some are holding two low-paying jobs and all don't earn enough from those jobs to actually cover their basic costs. On the left, the narrow bias in the far left favors the design, operation, implementation of special programs for special needs of one form or another by unionized and well-paid civil servants. My grandfather was a union leader. I believe in well-paid civil servants. I believe in public sector unions. They're an important part of who we are. But they are not more important than actually doing away with poverty. The world has the resources. This is an important thing to notice because some people say, well, we don't, we'd like to do it, but we don't have the resources to do it. The resources are there. This is a, this is a world that can produce enough food for everybody. It can produce enough clean water for everybody. It can produce enough housing for everybody. It could give jobs to everybody. These are, are, are not uh, sort of natural, you know, <laughs> It, uh, impediments. They, they're not. Maybe the whole uh, vision of sustainability is to begin to re-envision what is the role of government, because I don't think they're playing um, the um, the envisioned role that government should play as a neutral broker. Um, rather, they're playing out all the interests um, that uh, provide funding for their election campaigns. <laughs> we now have very little access to public monies, and we have to find almost entrepreneurial ways to generate monies for all of these things, whether it be women's shelters, um, or uh, for housing um, and so forth. So this has really put many, many of the non-governmental organizations into a tremendous bind. We have an awful lot of people that put a lot of work, and uh, not just work, but donations. And, and to me, this, this is not a form of taxation. It, we're really uh, supplementing what government programs should be doing. And I, I, I'm not saying that's unfair, and I know people are charitable in that, but I, I think to some degree the volunteers have been taken advantage of. Like when it comes to uh, giving monies to people, you know, 
for affordable housing, whatever. Uh, the province, years ago, the municipal mandate was that. But that's been changed now that that was taken over by the province. I'm finding it harder and harder um, to run the town on the funds that we have. And, uh, and, and to be perfect, to, to show you how, how it's gone, uh, I've compiled a list of all of the things that the town gives money to with all the grants. And I've said, you know, we've got to start looking at this because we can't keep this up. Our budget is, there's only the one taxpayer, and our budget is only basically property tax. And there's not much money there that, you know, that we can go with programs where the provincial government can, where people are paying taxes for that reason. Just the infrastructure requirements that we need in running this town, uh, we need more than what we can collect in taxes. And that's why you hear the towns really going after, you know, the provincial and the federal government infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Um, so unfortunately, something that like affordable housing tends to take a bit of a back seat. I know as a town council we do as much as we can and our, our, the councillors are all volunteering a lot of their time on different committees to make things better for the town. It's not to say that we don't see it as an important issue. We do. But our more pressing issue right now, as I would say, is right now is infrastructure. We had a presentation made by uh, two senators uh, uh, from Ottawa, and they came up with 75 uh, recommendations for uh, the reduction or elimination of poverty. And uh, th they made the statement uh, at that meeting that unless we make it a political issue or an election issue, those recommendations will gather dust. And. Uh, I think that's happening. Uh, I feel somehow we have to make poverty a voice at every election if we want to get the focus directed through the federal government, provincial government. As far as the municipality is concerned, uh, I agree with Jack that the funding is limited. Uh, but as I said to a question some time ago, uh, when someone says it's not the council's responsibilities, uh, all councillors are human. So it is their responsibility. And where are we when it comes to poverty? All oh, lots of terms and conditions, forms to fill out, welfare officers to meet, checking to go on. The things that say we want to institutionalize poverty and not actually eradicate it. I think our governments really need to start paying more attention to poverty and income assistance rates and affordable housing, <laughs> among a whole pile of other things. This goes way back to the 70s, I would say, that the seniors started to ask through the parish council. They would approach people on parish council and ask, is there any way we could put up a building in St. Andrews? And it got looked at, but every time there was no government money available. And when you run all the figures through, if you have no government assistance, they're going to have to pay too much rent to be able to afford it. So then it was. Yeah, whatever year it was, 2000, I'm not sure, 2004, that we found out that government was paying 25%, I think it was, of the cost of a building if they approved what you were doing. So then we figured, here's our chance to do it, and we were ready for it, and they accepted it. And I know Pumpkin applied, and we felt really bad that they didn't give Pumpkin a cracker, because I think Pumpkin would have done just as well. We formed a committee. We were about eight people and we called it housing committee and uh, yeah we did quite a lot of work. We had people from Halifax, people from those from Antigonish, people uh, telling us how they went about it, what their building was like, how was it, uh, was the building uh, like uh, uh, sun heated or uh, and yeah we, we, we got together quite a long time. The plans were very, very, uh, but they didn't go through because it's always paperwork, there's always uh, conditions that the government comes in with and that you cannot fill and that you cannot, 
uh, what we haven't given up. There was so much red tape to get that money till it was actually delivered. There were times that we had to wait with moving on because we didn't have funds to work with because they were so strict with the way they did things. When we were talking to them about doing this with as much volunteer labor as we could, well, they had question marks all around their heads. Yes, yeah, we didn't have a hope until we told them this building you're in, that was 90% done with volunteer labor. The curling rink next door was all done with volunteer labor except for the concrete. And then they began to pay attention. Everybody knows what we're trying to do, so they're sort of volunteering to keep things down. It's a beautiful location. It's a the 1970s, I was working as a field worker with the extension department, and uh, one of my first projects was dealing with uh, low-income families and in the black community, but it did end up, we were working in the white communities as well, because there were poor white families. However, we looked at a program, after going out into the community and talking to the people about the need for jobs and education, most people said, that's fine, but housing is more important to us. So I go back to the extension and sit around the board and talk about, this is what the people see as the need. And if this peop the, the people see this need, then we have to do something about it. You paid according to your income, some person, or some family rather, who did not have an income, they paid the very lowest. Most of the families were living in homes who, that did not have water, access to water, or sewage, bathrooms. Of course, I, was, I grew up in the same situation. I grew up in a home that did not have it. We spent meeting after meeting in these people's homes, talking to them about how to access it, what it meant to them. And most of the people, now some people, I must say, did not go for it. They were kind of, um, what's the word? They were just a little, I'm not sure about it, so I'm going to stay away from it. But the people that did, we spent meeting after meeting, sitting in their homes, uh, educating them to uh, what it meant, what they needed to do. They had to do some work themselves. Probably the best thing here would be for more public housing to be built. There's no reason why after decades of neglect, the province couldn't build uh, a couple of family units or four family units in each of the three communities. We're having trouble already establishing a, a committee of people who could drive a project and own the project and rent it out to people and get the money from the government to do all of that stuff. It's murder trying to get people to sit around the table and consistently come to meetings and be ready to sign on the dotted line when it comes to taking responsibility for borrowing. And responsibility. Yeah, That's yeah. A borrow half a million dollars from the bank. You want your name on the document? Mm -hmm. Well, there's certain people who just wouldn't, you know, if you just wouldn't be comfortable doing that kind of thing. Okay. So that's why the, the case needs to be made here for public housing. Government owned, government <coughs> run. The community doesn't have to do a need survey. They don't have to put a committee together. They don't have to fundraise. They don't have to do anything. You just get some pieces of land, build some public housing. You know, the black community is a distinct cultural uh, group and a group that faces disadvantage that a lot of other people don't face. So it is justifiable to just focus on helping the black communities right now. So what I discovered is I started off assuming that no housing has been developed here for a very long time. 1975. Late 70s, when St. Bex Extension was involved. Uh, and uh, before that, it was a few DVA homes. We figured that there are probably a few veterans who came back and either got money to repair their homes or they got money to build a new home. Mm -hmm. And there weren't very many of them. Mm -hmm. So before that, so there was nothing. Yeah. So we had a handful of homes built in the communities after the Second World War. 
Then there were about, well, it's not sure, we're not sure if it's 37 or 39 that were built during the, during the 70s. And since then, people have been getting RAP grants to uh, repair the homes and that are existing. After about a year or a year and a half, we, were, we saw the fruits of our labor, and uh, I still see it as I drive to the communities. Now, what it did to their dignity and their self-assurance, it's, I, I can't, I, no, 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 I can't express it, because I saw the difference, and I still see the difference. I feel very uncomfortable that we're building our society especially the ability to meet social needs for those who are unable to meet them for themselves at the moment, built on the um, philanthropy of wealthy people, uh, whether it be in our own little community or uh, at large, I find that really distressing. We need to resolve the issue of poverty here, and we need to do it. Government will do what we demand of it. People don't want to speak up because then it's self-identification, right? And, and the, the dignity thing comes in, and the respect and all that. Um, that, that is a drawback, I, but it's very hard to uh, tell people with a lot of pride, you know, go out in the street and tell everybody you're poor. I'm tired of talking, or I'm tired of going to meetings and hearing people talking about a certain situation or issue or concern and we go away and that's the end of it. I guess perhaps the only way to get the result is put it out there, talk and more talk. But how much can we talk? Hit them over the head. Hit them over the head and say it's there, do something. But uh, I'm weary myself of going and going to meetings and meetings and putting it out there and talking and, and trying to come to some conclusion or some and nothing happened.